Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Facebook Live segment from CJ Online. Uh, this has to do with a story that Katie Moore is working on regarding the record number of homicides in Topeka last year, and, and unfortunately, it's that trend has continued into 2018. We have assembled a panel of speakers here to discuss the the issues that they think might be relevant to this problem and also solutions that are you know, could possibly be examined. With us from left to right, <laughs> Jim McCullough, Executive Director of the Topeka Center for Peace and Justice, Reverend Tobias Schlingensiepen, pastor of First Congregational Church, Shante Price, she's with the organization Mothers of Murdered Sons, Curtis Pitts, community organizer who's been involved in many youth programs over the years in Topeka, and also Michelle McCormick, director of the YWCA's Center for Safety and Empowerment. And Michelle, we're going to go the opposite direction and start with, with you. A lot of you submitted essays to Katie um, in preparation for our discussion today. And uh, Michelle, I know you touched on the role that Domestic violence sometimes plays uh, in the in the issues with the violent crime here in Topeka, and it's it's not not always that, but, but there is that element. And you know, I, you've you've kind of made a made a point that you would hope to see the city leaders become more involved in attempting to find solutions. Yeah. I think that, I'm not sure if people recognize this, but five of the 30 homicides from last year were domestic violence homicides. And so they were situations where it was an intimate partner or a former intimate partner or someone who was in a dating relationship who murdered uh, their significant other. And um, certainly that concern was at the YWCA Center for Safety and Empowerment. And people have been really studying the issue of domestic violence homicides for a long time, trying to figure out what do we do? How do we prevent them? Because there's certainly an idea that we can prevent them. And uh, the best model that I have seen has been when a community comes together in a coordinated response to really make sure uh, that all of our systems are in alignment and working on the same page to hold offenders accountable, uh, offenders of domestic violence, and to create victim safety. And for years, our agencies coordinated a multidisciplinary team to try to look at best practices, policies, procedures, uh, and that team has brought together our agency, the Topeka Police Department, the Shawnee County Sheriff's Office, the DA's Office, and others, the hospitals, uh, some school folks, that kind of thing, to really coordinate our efforts. And those efforts have gone up and down and up and down, and it's been really difficult to make sure we have um, community protocols that are updated and that are progressive in trying to make sure we really address these issues. And so we have begun the process of, of re-engaging our city leaders in, to get involved in that multidisciplinary team. And we, uh, we really hope that we're gonna see some more significant engagement in that. And I think part of our challenge has been um, that our state laws have codified much of domestic violence as just a misdemeanor and people in the community and in our systems really, um, I think, take that mean that it's not that serious. It's just a misdemeanor. Um, but I promise you that the research demonstrates really clearly that if we treat misdemeanor domestic violence significantly and seriously, we can prevent domestic violence homicides. And I think that's sort of the direction. <coughs> yeah. Curtis, you've been involved in I think youth activities ranging from football to fishing. Um, <laughs> I, just kind of give us maybe a broad overview of how you've seen these activities help, you know, be able to develop kids as they as they grow older and what they get out of them and what can we do as a community to maybe even establish more activities or establish longer hours at, at our community centers or at schools to keep those kids involved in them in those places? Well, one of the things I want to, you know, premise about what I'm about to say is that I think at this table we have some outstanding people. I'm very proud to be at the table with you guys. So 
as I go into this mode here, I want you to understand that it has nothing to do with anybody at the table, but it has to be brought to the surface. Historically in our city, we have been the, the front line for fighting what's wrong and unjust. You had the people of faith move from back east and other parts of the country to draw a line in the sand in Kansas against racism and against slavery. And since then, the intent was when they made Washburn, they called it Lincoln University, it was supposed to be a school for free slaves and everybody else. And since then, since we had the Great Society, you know, post Brown, we had the Great Society. And coming from, you know, the South and seeing the same thing happen here. The most dangerous thing that we've had, and we're going to continue to perpetuate this violence in our community, is, is that when we have the people who are at the at the root need of our community not being able to create the programming that's necessary for themselves, then you're going to continue to have these outbreaks of violence through our, our site. If you look back historically through your own documents here in the newspaper, you can see in the 90s. When I predicted what was going to happen right now, because being out there in the trenches, you can see the direction that our city was going in the lackadaisical attitude. And I, I'm enjoying the fact that, you know, we got people at the table who are thinking outside of the box. What, what's happened historically is that we've created programs and boards and task force of people who think alike and act alike and have very little to do in that target area that we're trying to serve. So if we don't teach the people how to fish, because we spent trillions of dollars on social needs in our society. And the problem has been is that we've had programming coming from the outside into those communities, and they haven't got a chance to learn how to fish and survive. You know, one thing about the YWCA, people don't realize what a strong history they've had in combating racism historically. So the things that have gotten us to the point, we stopped the dialogue after 54 and after Dr. King. and. Everybody's saying, well, racism is on the rise in our nation. Honestly, everybody in our nation, we're all like deer in the headlight because we don't know <laughs> what's going on next. The dialogue isn't there. Right. Yeah. And if we're, if we're having meetings and everybody in the meetings are the same people we see on every task force and every board, mm -hmm. it's a done deal. We're not going to get anything done. Right. And so I don't serve on a lot of task force and a lot of boards because I know the end result is going to be programming for the comfort zone. I was just out at a meeting and I saw the Social Security office out by 6th and Wanamaker. I'm like, wow, the people who needed access to that more than anybody can't get there without a bus. So we're programming for the provider rather than the people who we're trying to help. And I say this over and over again, and I'm going to make people mad. The school districts have so much money, I don't even think they know what to do. And I can tell you, we have um, so many opportunities here in our city and in our community We've got to shake some things off and say, okay, Brown was in Topeka for a reason. Brown was in Topeka for a reason because the people here in Topeka have a greater conscience than anybody I've ever seen around the nation. When we were in the South having race riots and at schools, people were going to school here in middle school and high school together of all races. They would bust us from like here, we'd go to school in Silver Lake. And I'm going, Topeka has a heart that we're not tapping into yeah. Because the people have a genuine desire. When I came here, I was so stunned that people were living everywhere. Because where I come from in Florida, it's still segregated mm -hmm. pretty much right now. And also the fact that you, and I'm going to stop talking after this, that we're in a crisis mode because our kids are making decisions that they're not prepared to make. Yes. And the reason that our kids are at the school so much is not because we have bad parenting, but because being poor mm -hmm. has been the best cash cow in the history of our yes. United States. Yeah. And I say this to people all the time. If you put trillions of dollars in East Topeka looks the same way and worse than what it did before integration, then you have a problem. There's, what, 90% less African-American businesses in East Topeka now and in Topeka after integration, after trillions of dollars. And you see the same thing happening where people of all races are concerned. It is the dialogue right now. Our young people are making decisions that they're not prepared to make. They're taking on philosophies and beliefs that we as adults should be teaching them something different. Love, respect, understanding, and compassion, hard work. Because our society is saying now we put so much money into it. The poor in our society are almost like the beta players. 
Mm -hmm. None of us have a beta player anymore. Mm -hmm. And everything our society does not need anymore, we discard it. And right now, the poor and the racial minorities are the beta players. We're discarding them and moving on to other areas of discussion when we've never addressed and finished dealing with the issue of race. Poor kids in Topeka, poor doesn't have a color. Poverty isn't a race. We've got tremendously good kids, yeah. tremendous organizational heads. All I'm saying is, you want to change the peak and make every program stay up at 8 o'clock during the week and 11 o'clock on the weekends. Yes. Then you'll see change. Then the kids will see we have a commitment. I thank this group here because it makes me feel good and gives me hope. Very nice. Sean Day, can you just kind of maybe get into what your organization not only does, but the scene and, and kind of how it has evolved. Um, I'm with Moms spokesman. We're spokeswoman. We're pretty new. Um, unfortunately, we developed because of tragedy, um, unsolved murders, uh, murders. Period. Um, it was a lack of support, is what brought our group together. A lack of knowing where to go to get the support when you're going through this tragedy. And I myself have went through two personal tragedies, one murder solved, one unsolved, both here in Topeka. Um, I'm at the point where I can be resilient now and I can speak for those that are still going through that because I, as Mr. Pitts has said, I've been in the trenches. Um, I'd like to kind of piggyback a little bit on what he said and kind of the general consensus here is that it's about our youth and I, I personally think the earlier that we start, the better. We have to start early. So mom's mission right now is not only to, to try to supply the support, but right now we're actually working with um, New Mount Zion on trying to develop um, some programs to where we can meet every other month to supply that support and that knowledge of where to go when you're going through something like this. Our second goal that we're working on right now is with the Boys and the Girls Club so that we can try to get these organizations in East Topeka, um, in Central Topeka, because I think that we leave out Central Topeka, we're kind of linked a little bit. Um, I'm a Central Topeka girl, but I love the East Side. It's why I chose to purchase my home in this area, because it's a diversified group of people. There's not one, we're not over here, we're all together. And I think once we grasp and get an idea, and it's going to start with our city leadership, I, I think we're on the right path with our chief. Um, it's going to start with our city leadership that it's not just your district or this district. It's all of our district. It's not just the commissioner, well, we're deciding this, where this water park is going to go, where this is going to go. We all <coughs> of you, we all see what's going on, and there's a lot of division. There's a lot of misappropriateness going on. And until it's addressed head on, we're going to continue to see this. Now, I have a buy-in because I live in the neighborhood. A lot of people don't have that buy-in. Um, I saw a lot with Mr. Pitts because my sons came from Shawnee Heights and I brought one into Highland Park. Um, so for me going from one district to another district, I saw a big, big difference. And for me, when I looked at it, they were all children. It amazed me that when we look at these children, who are who are children, whether, whether they're a bad child or a good child or whatever we think about them, they have a life. And it's up to us as adults to show them that there's a different way. Now, it's going to take a little bit and we're going to, it's, it's probably going to get a little ugly and uncomfortable for some people in our community, but it's time to rip that Band-Aid off and just be honest about what we've done. And what we've done is we've destroyed parts of town that it's gonna take a while to rebuild. And that's just it, you know? When you go and you can see kids walking with no shoes, no socks, barely making it, that hurts me. And it should hurt all of us as just a human. It's just human nature. And I think we've lost that humanity. Now, we have a law, we, we're in a state where anyone can carry a gun. So, I don't know if you're a convicted felon. I don't know if you're a convicted felon. All I know is that any one of us can carry a gun. So if that doesn't scare us enough that we need to change some legislation, get some yeah. different people, these are things that we're going to have to fix. But as far as our youth goes, that's where it's all at. 
That's where everything needs to be done. We need to figure all of this out because they're losing. And when we're talking to mothers who are in turmoil because they lost their son over something so senseless, it's just there's nothing worth taking a life over. And when you're 16 or 17, 18, and you're making a decision to take a life, you're not even thinking that decision through. It's a spur of the moment. And that goes back to we have to have better dialogue with our youth. We have to not only demand respect from them, but also give them respect. It's a two-way street. They're young adults, but we're treating them like adults, and we expect them to be a child. We can't have it all kind of ways. We've got to show some leadership here, and that's missing. Um, the mediation is a big key. I think if we have the proper people in there, um, it's, it doesn't always take a, a degree, just common sense to go and have the heart to sit down and talk to some of these youth, I think we could stop some of this. You know, I never raised my sons to be in this, but I've been in this world and I know how scary it is. Mm -hmm. I'm firsthand here to tell you that it's a scary road to walk, to know that you didn't raise your child a certain way, but because of the way someone else may walk, they may have to walk different and do things different to survive in this world. I don't think that we quite understand what it takes to survive as a youth in the streets nowadays. I don't think that we get it. Um, the world is moving way faster than what we can even keep up with. Imagine them, and they've been born into it. So there's a lot of different things that go on, but we have to come together for our youth first. And then we're going to start seeing a big difference as far as everything else. And I would like to say that this is a great panel, and we need to continue these conversations. And we need to keep this dialogue open. And if we see a fit that my group can fit here or my group can fit here, we've got to make it work. And I, like Curtis, I don't want to sit or have a lot of committees because I think sometimes you just get caught up in the committees and what you want to do or we want to see. It's time for action. And it's actually past time for action. Tobias, you kind of make that point, too, in the essay you wrote to Katie and that, you know, it's, it's not just... The problem for those who are in these households or might have tragically lost a loved one, it's it's a community's issue. And how do we get that through to the community as a whole? That, that's, that's my fundamental question. You know, I, when I look at last year's statistics, I say in the essay, last year uh, our neighbors killed a number, a record number of our neighbors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. yeah, that, yeah. that, that, that yeah. frames it in a very different loss. kind of way. It's our mm -hmm. loss. It is our loss, and to pretend like it's just happening over there, uh, it doesn't understand the mobile nature uh, of, of, of people today, for one thing. But it also fails to, to really address the question, if we as citizens of the city of Topeka, or Shawnee County, or Kansas, or the nation for that matter, you know, how do we define community, and what does that actually mean? And, and in my understanding of community, it's that whatever happens to any part of that community affects everybody, and that therefore the solutions uh, need to be, uh, be of concern, potential solutions to absolutely everybody in it. So, so you, don't, you, don't, you don't create silos like we currently have. Uh, you don't allow those to, to continue to exist in that way. Um, you have to, people have to crawl out of their silos. Now, I, I, I was very intrigued uh, by everyone who spoke already. I was very intrigued by what you had to say about the dialogue around race. Uh, so I'm the pastor of First Congregational Church. The only reason the congregational churches are in Kansas were to, to keep slavery from coming into the state. Uh, you know, we helped found Washburn University as a congregational founding. Uh, and, 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 and Washburn was over African Americans and women from day one. But you are absolutely right or take Charles Sheldon of Central Congregational Church and the work he was doing over in Tennessee Town. Okay, those, are, those are congregational commitments. However, as you stated very correctly, I think, in the post-war years, uh, when massive amounts of population shifted from rural areas to cities, uh, the makeup of this city changed as well, and many cities changed. And I think, I think uh, people were so busy trying to, trying to make it uh, in the post-war economy that everybody was kind of looking out for themselves and, and, and that's how the silo mentality really really started and we turned our backs on those progressive commitments that, that you were talking about our meeting uh, and, we, and we failed to have those conversations even in my congregation I remember that I remember when I was a kid I grew up at my church I remember the pastor who was a civil rights advocate basically was, was forced out because it was just too much for some of our members to take and we have to face those difficult truths mm -hmm. 
uh, in our churches and, and, and in our realities. I'm glad to say that we have turned that around okay, yes. <laughs> in the years since then. But now these conversations have to go to a different level. And I, I think what I think is really important is that I think, we, I think we do need to start with children. I agree with that. And I think we also need our city and county leadership to say we really want to tackle this issue yes. and all of the tributaries mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to things that are happening uh, that are leading to the homicides. And, and when somebody takes a gun, the intention of threatening somebody else or killing somebody else, we have missed an awful lot uh, behind that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that that's, yes. that's the last, right that. that's the last uh, <clears throat> you know, yes. uh, act uh, that puts a finality behind all kinds of things that we've already missed. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think... <laughs> okay, this is commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and really what's needed is, is, is for, for, for someone, okay, to... to Accountably say, and who else but our elected officials can do that? Yeah. That this is a this is a this is a topic that we want to tackle. It's an issue we want to tackle rather in this community, and uh, and we need a plan. And uh, and we analyze the problem first of all, uh, all the way across town, uh, as detailed as we can. And then what we need is public, private, not for profit uh, uh, stakeholders coming together and saying, okay, who's going to play what role in? In, in mm -hmm. contribute what resources to this problem that we have and in what ways and, and be held accountable for being part of that team approach. That's right. And there's more involved, of course. There's, there's, there's communication across Kansas Avenue, uh, from mm -hmm. one part of town to the other part. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been, we've been trying to build coalitions of, of churches, and not just churches, but also faith communities, uh, mm -hmm. the Islamic Center and Temple Beshalom also, and, and trying to build an awareness that, that this kind of divide across our city should no longer exist and that we need to find ways to engage with each other. Um, and finally, really do it. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it for a long time. Yes. Uh, we get together and we, we huddle, as one pastor said, very, very well, <laughs> but when it's time to go down on the field and make the play, mm -hmm. uh, nobody can be found. So, so all these points are very well taken. So I think that the, the leadership and the accountability has to be brought uh, to the table uh, by, by our civic leaders and, and, and by our elected officials, rather, and then I think Organizations need to be brought together, and they need to together develop a plan uh, to address the various aspects of the problem. And then the resources, the human resources, the institutional resources, the financial resources mm -hmm. need to be found. Mm -hmm. Like it or not, schools are the places where our kids spend the majority of the hours of each and every day, and, uh, and where are they going when they're not in school. And when, and when poverty dictates that parents have to be working from morning till night, mm -hmm. maybe there aren't grandparents available to jump in and, mm -hmm. and, and all the rest of this. And, and, there we really have to, to make an effort. And we have to provide yeah. mentors, and we have to provide role models, and we have to provide people who, who, who show a path to opportunity. Yes. And I think, I think that's what our schools are there for, and, 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 and more and more now we have to get kids in a place where they can actually benefit from what schools are designed to offer. But if we don't do that, they can only fail. And, and we, in, in this world global economy, if our kids are, are being set up to fail, uh, this nation is being set up to fail. It really is. And, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Jim can add to this discussion, but I'd, I'd like for you to kind of also go into maybe some youth activities that the center provides. And, and I know you start with kids who are pretty young. Right. Right. Well, I want to first say thanks to the Capital Journal for yes. what you're doing. I believe um, uh, what we're talking about around the table here is lifting up a sense of awareness that we have a real toxic um, climate. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that needs to be lifted up and lifted out. People need to be able to read that in the paper. They need to be able to see it on Facebook. We've got a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I thank you, for Katie, for, for um, helping us to speak out like this. Uh, yes, the Peace Center has um, uh, three programs that we are engaged in specifically. Well, if we first of all operate out of the philosophy that there's no such thing as a bad kid, that kids make mistakes as adults make mistakes. And sometimes we get ourselves going the wrong direction and in the wrong group, like you were saying. Um, we do peace camp every year, uh, and like Tobias said uh, earlier, that's only one week out of the year. But we hope we make an impression on kids. We have really honed in our curriculum, and we talk about bullying. We talk about it from the perspective of the one who is doing the bullying, the one who is the victim of it, and the one who's the bystander, and what to do in all of those instances. 
Um, and we spend five days, we do crafts, we do all kinds of, of things. And, and First Congregational has been our host church for that for the past three or four years, and we're deeply appreciative to them for that. The second thing we're doing is justice circles in the schools. It's a restorative practices uh, where kids, when they get in trouble, rather than sending them to some kind of punitive kind of um, response to um, conflict in the halls, um, we have trained 58 teachers and administrators are in that group as well as teachers but to implement justice, restorative justice circles in the, in the school uh, environment, in the school culture, um, where when kids get uh, into some kind of a infraction with one another, we sit down at a table and a trained leader, teacher, administrator, talk, helps them to talk it out and say, you know, what do we learn from this? What's, going, what's really at the bottom of this? I think we've all kind of indicated that, you know, when we get to the point of the gun, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's already happened way behind that. What we're trying to do is to figure out what's going on way behind that yes. and to try to, yes. you know, uh, work against that. So we're excited that we've been able to do that and if we can find funding, we're gonna to continue to do it. Um, uh, we, do, we have initiated that training through the Kansas Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Uh, the third thing <clears throat> that we're doing is the Victim Offender Mediation Program. And um, our Kansas legislature uh, finally came to the conclusion uh, a couple of years ago that, that, um, that the punitive kinds of approaches that we've taken with, with juvenile justice has not been an effective way of solving criminal mm -hmm. issues with, with young people, and that we need to do the kind of things we're talking about around this table. Um, and so we have um, a, a full-time uh, mediator specialist on our staff now. Uh, we've been able to do that because um, the correction, uh, Department of Corrections has received uh, a lot of funding that had been for incarceration. We don't believe in youth incarceration in most cases. We, we need to be doing something more constructive with these kids than throwing them in the clinker. I mean, that is just not working and thankfully the legislature finally figured that out and so the money that we've been using to incarcerate kids is now going to be able to come back to community organizations that are specifically working with kids to try to help them let's name the problem what's really going on here why you know why are you really beating up on your neighbor uh, in the locker next to you so so that's the third thing and I know we've said a few things a little negative about task forces, but we do believe that leadership needs to get together. Mm -hmm. And the Peace Center believes that um, there are a lot of impassioned people in this community about the very issue that we're talking about, and this table proves that. Uh, we have, at the initiation of our new chief of police, Bill Cochran, but he came to my office before he was named chief of police, before he was even named interim the chief of police, came to me to say, what can we do about this? Let's get our heads together. Mm -hmm. Let's collaborate between the, the law enforcement and the Peace Center, and let's talk about what can we do. And as a result, we had 20 people last a, a week ago, last Tuesday, sitting around the table. These people represented the African American community represented the Latino, Latina, Latina community. Um, they represented um, faith communities um, and Washburn University, uh, mental health. Trying to put all, and all those people are as passionate about this issue as what we're talking about here today. And we're in the incubatory stages, but we're trying to say, okay, where do we go? What can we do? How can we, uh, how can we, deal with this. We have a horrendous problem. And, and so the, the Peace Center's Task Force on Violence Prevention is at work. We intend to get out to neighborhood um, NIAs. We intend to get out to the boards of directors of organizations like the Y and others that all of you are involved in to say, how can we work together? And so um, a task force, like, you, like I say, there has to be leadership. We have to put our heads together. together. Mm -hmm. We're all impassioned. We all have a passion for fixing this. So, mm -hmm. and 
the Capital Journal was at our last meeting. I was pleased to have Samantha uh, there in that meeting too. So. And, I, and I did want to make a clarification. We, you know, when I talk about task force, you know, I've served on the university, you know, committee that's one level below the regions at Washburn. I came to town, I came from the King Center in Atlanta. I was Mrs. King's National Youth Coordinator, hmm. and I worked in Alabama, did civil rights, wow. had the Molotov cocktails. When you see the documentary on Viola Luzzo and her son, Tony, oh, oh. you see a thinner version of me out there. <laughs> he and I were trying to stay alive in the backwoods of Alabama, dodging Molotov cocktails. Wow. You know, the reason I want to make clarification, the first thing is that in our community, and I'm talking about the poor and the African American community, the key thing to us is faith and education. And Dr. King, they were after social change. In our society now, we're focusing more on social engineering. And if we're doing social engineering, that means that we're not accepting the culture from whence we're supposed to be trying to help. And if, we, if we're creating organizations and plans and agendas, and you're talking about a population that's not at the table, yeah, right, yeah, right. then you're doing social engineering. Yes. And I, I, yes. want to, I want to say and Let me finish, okay. let me finish. Because I, I know you guys have a good heart and you're doing the right thing. I'm not questioning what you're doing at all. The problem we have in our society, and we have to fix it in Topeka before it gets fixed anywhere in our nation. Mm -hmm. We have to say those that we're trying to help need to have access to the dollars and be taught how to fish. Mm -hmm. We have not had access to, do to the dollars in the poorest community. And the most dangerous thing is, is that we got to the point that we're at now. Good people have thrown up their hands and closed off their pockets yeah. because they've dumped money in for all these years and they can still go across into East Topeka and see empty buildings and vacant lots. Okay. And the way that has to change is those people that we're talking about helping in Eastern and Central Topeka, they have to see how the money's managed. They have to have a financial coach as they're developing programs and activities within their community. Our kids are so smart that they know when it's, a, we call it storefronting in the South. We're going to have a big giant office over here and then there's going to be a small storefront over here where they have one staff person, but the majority of the money is administered from that part of town by that group of people that we're not in, in, interacting with. And I'm saying this not to you guys because you're here and you're on the front line. We can't expect society to keep putting money in places <coughs> where they're not seeing any return on their dollars. Mm -hmm. Our currency in our community right now is service. It's not so much a matter of how many dollars we get. I was one of those kids that went to a Catholic high school. I was the only black kid in my graduating class. In my brother's class, you know, there was a graduating class of 1,400, and there's hundreds of black kids. But when I went to that school, people assumed automatically that I was going to go to this private school and never come back to my community because that's what they taught me in their programming. Mm -hmm. But when I got out, I mean, because of my faith community, I knew immediately once I graduated, I had to take what I learned and bring it back and make sure I could apply it to my community. When Dr. King talked about integration and they talked about integration, they were talking about integrating the cultures, views, philosophy, teaching methods. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we have done none of that. And to be honest, most black schools were like Hayden High School. Very stern, very disciplined. Yep. When you walk into a school in 501, the behavior of the kids is not reflective of what happens at their home yeah. because they will not and cannot act like that in the community. Mm -hmm. But what they're being taught and social engineered to believe at the schools at the earliest possible level is that there is no behavior plan, there is no boundaries. Mm -hmm. And in yes. society, by the time they get to be in ninth grade, when you see them, you're clutching your purses and you're locking your doors because mm -hmm. instead of disciplining them and preparing them to compete in the world in this global society, we've collared them and not made them competitive. I, I want my son to go to school to learn how to read and write. And as they say, do arithmetic. And I shut up after I say this. If my son came home and told me that the teacher didn't like him because he was black, we have a problem because I never sent my kid to school to be liked. And I never expected a teacher to teach my kids social skills, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And you assume that, not you guys, but people assume that our parents and poor parents don't care about their kids, is that when they walk into the door from preschool to head start, 
their values and the culture is wiped out so that anything goes. Now, our kids are using drugs now because they're medicated. As we say, they're medicated the manhood out of them at an early age, and by the time they get to be 18, the government does not pay for those drugs anymore. So now they're taking everything because they're already addicts. The first drug pushes our kids get is the government. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so you're saying, you're saying that, 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 that they're getting medications like for ADHD yes. or everything you can name of Riddle and that kind of thing, and then they get to a certain point, all that's no longer available, and you're and, and so they, they're yes, self-medicating in a sense. Mm -hmm. And some of it would even shouldn't have been available in the beginning because they didn't need it. And if you look at our state legislature, it was Senate Bill 155 or 151, where they were paying where our kids can go to vocational training and high school at the same time. And if they do it correctly, the school district does it correctly, they can almost graduate with an associate's yes. degree. Mm -hmm. But we're not thinking like that. We're talking about, okay, how are we going to change these social mores and values <laughs> that are in, almost innate within our community? So on Friday, Monday through Friday, they hear the Big Bang Theory. Okay. Um, the rest of the time, in the evening time on Saturday, they hear the rest of the Lord. And so at best, with the programming that we're offering now, we're going to reach 5% of them. And with that 5%, you're going to have some success stories. I've operated a camp in this city since 1990 every summer. And right now we're finally seeing the results where we have gang members and people who are in the 90s world, which you would call broken kids, their kids are going off to college now. Mm -hmm. And we're having an impact wherein we use sweat equity. We didn't say give us a whole bunch of money. We said, okay, if it means something to us as a community, we got to self-finance. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't self-finance, then we're going to get a whole lot of other rules. Mm -hmm. But right now in our society, the community is smart enough, the kids are picking it up, and we know for a fact we're only going to get a small select group. The teachers going to nominate the ones they like, right. and you guys who want to get to everybody and get to all the kids, you don't get to see them. Yeah. And so I'm saying to you, we got a chance. This, this era in Topeka, we could not just set Topeka on the path that it has to be, but nationally we integrated the entire world from Topeka, but we didn't finish the deal. So now we're running around with a three-wheel car. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I'm going to maybe end this, but I want everybody to, to comment. When you see this number, this <coughs> devastating number, which was 30 last year, three already this year, 33 murders in our community. And just to see, see that in front of you. What, what first goes through your mind and when you saw that that rate and the record that was set what what popped through your head I think for me what popped in my head was disbelief we're not that big and I know that people say it happens everywhere but it may and it does but we're small um, we tend to know each other or know somebody who knows you. So it's a little bit more personal. Um, so for me, it was fear because what's going to change that? We've got to figure out something to change it. So that was, for me, fear and disbelief. You know? Me, I know that it could have been 60. Mm -hmm. yeah. It could have been 60 so easily that people have no idea. Every Saturday night, I'm going to, well, I hope, I can, I hope they'll accept it, but every Saturday night, I go from neighborhood to neighborhood talking to people. You know, it usually ends about midnight when I'm, you know, trying to give the last lecture. Like, Curtis, what are you doing? Hopefully, I come in, they're having a barbecue or cookout, you know, they're all for me. <laughs> seriously, these guys that you think are out on the streets creating violence, if you look at the pattern, the guys who are defined as the gang leaders or the troublemakers, they were working like, Curtis, this thing is out of control. Mm -hmm. We got to, somebody needs to do something with these kids. We won't engage. If you look at, like you said, most of the situations were domestic, mm -hmm. where it was, I'm mad, I'm angry, or you left me or you hurt me, I love you and you don't love me enough, when the truth of it is, the problem you have is that you don't love yourself enough, so right. you're trying to get somebody to love you more. Right. And so, I'm looking at this thing, I'm going, we didn't even get to the powder cake part of it yet. And if we don't have these dialogues and jump on it, uh -huh. 30 will seem like, because I got the demographics from like 1950 when there was only one. Mm -hmm. And then 54, there's maybe two. The more time we don't have a family and a community, those numbers keep growing. And like you said, the kids spend too much time in school and less time in their community. 
then you're not going to have a, a village anymore. And, you know, with muscle memory and video games, I don't care. I don't get any money off the games. Coaches make us practice football all the time because we can do the same thing even if we're tired. We do the same play over and over again. And I realized that I was so fatigued. And when they snapped the ball, I knew swim, get flat to the line, and take on the blocker, come, the pulling guard, even if I was wore out. So if you're playing a video game all day and you're shooting, killing Grand Theft Auto, they can't sue me. I'm already broke. I only get $3 out of me. <laughs> but if, if, they, if they do that, then what's going to happen is they're not even thinking like, boom, like what's supposed to do, kill. So you got the right idea. you got to have a peace camp. you got to strip down, excuse me about that, you got to strip down the the lack of moral judgment in our kids and replace it back with some of those values that we used to have. There's another issue, though, that hits me, strikes me, and you alluded to it when you were talking. It's way too easy to get guns. And there is something incredibly and seriously wrong with our whole culture. Mm-hmm. Not just Topeka, but our whole culture um, that is that is allowing big money to make it so easy for these kids to have lethal weapons. Mm-hmm. I just think you know, when, that's the first thing I think of. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I realize there's a lot of issues that the kids are dealing with. That's a big not, to to put, not to, to minimize that easy. Not to minimize that point at all. You know, gun sales stand in relationship to people's fear. Mm-hmm. Right. Fears are being deftly exploited at every political yes. level these days. That's right. And we've just come off a presidential election that has shown an unprecedented amount of, of fear mongering and also has demonstrated really that bullying gets you places. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And when you see that represented, you know, by your highest elected officials, it does something to people's behaviors yes. across the board, and I'm, mm-hmm. I feel that I really do. I do too. And I and I, I don't think this is who we are, mm-hmm. uh, but I think I think that there's a lot of global economic change, uh, a lot of societal change uh, related to that, and we're all not quite sure uh, right. where we fit into this. And because we don't know how to deal with this, there's this kind of visceral response. Well, I'm going to make sure that my area, my valley. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, ready. You know, I'm king, right? <laughs> yes. I'm ready. Okay, it's got a Y2K uh, a mm-hmm. sort of syndrome, right? Uh, uh, but, but really, I think the only way to combat that is is to kind of unplug from the social media brainwash uh, that we that we bathe ourselves in, and that we locally begin to say, okay, our responsibility starts here. Yes. And we're gonna we're gonna own it here, and we're going to pay attention to what happens here, and we're going to look at progress here, and if we're successful here successful in our own community, then we have something to say to other communities. Mm-hmm. If we're successful in one neighborhood, we have yes. something to say in another neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and somehow, somehow how we break it down into those different areas, and then how we bring it all together, mm-hmm. both at the same time, mm-hmm. that's, that's going to be really key. And I think, I, think uh, I, I, I add what they have said, thanking you all for you know, providing this forum. Uh, but also creating the awareness that you know allows us and, and others, hopefully too, you know, to to really try to tackle this in a in a, in a concerted way yes. that brings everyone to the table who is not at the table, uh, and uh, and those who are coming to the table, I think, need to also kind of, and I say this to pastors particularly, uh, we're often guilty of kind of creating our own little fiefdoms of influence, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's a cancer. <laughs> It's a terrible cancer, and, and we have got to figure out that that, uh, that what's good for everybody is always good for me, not necessarily the other way around. Right. And, right. and we have to change our emphasis there. Michelle, we've started with you. Is there anything yeah. you want to add? Well, these guys are really hard to follow. <laughs> but I would just say that, you know, of course, what I was struck by is that I think of in each of those individual circumstances, there is a ripple effect of people who are impacted by each of those deaths, right? And I think... Um, uh, in, in, in my work, I see that unresolved cruelty creates more cruelty in the world, and so my yes. concern is is how how are how is the impact of those homicides going to impact people for a long time? And my my fear is since I've been in Topeka, um, I have struggled with sort of the this uh, sort of 
self-hate that I have experienced from mm -hmm. other Topekans, and my concern is that people are going to just say, ah, that's just Topeka. Yes. You know how Topeka is. Oh, and, you know, and, and, and they, they, of course, take the fact that we're the, the capital and the place where our government acts as, as if there is something wrong with Topeka. Right. And so my concern is that people are just satisfied and that the action is going to stop there. Uh, and so I, I, I get hope from the dialogue today mm -hmm. that there is some action and there's got to be some movement. And I, I think I am proud to be a Topekan, yes. and I want this city to reflect that. And I want it to be the kind of community where everybody feels proud to be a Topekan. Yes. And I think we do that by centering the most marginalized people and their needs, and then everybody will benefit from that. And so this affects all of us, and I hope people understand that. Thank you, panel. Thanks a lot for the discussion. I hope, thank you. Uh, thank you. I hope it helps in some way. We sure do. And thank make you. sure and read Katie's uh, piece on Sunday. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank we you. Will. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You know, Curtis.